talk about uh, his death for us today and the darkness that surrounded it and what that means to us as we live in Nashville, Tennessee uh, in 2014. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So, uh, tonight, when we get done, we have an activity plan. Well, we may wait till the go girls go to bed, but maybe not. So, have you guys ever heard of Liege Waffles? L-E-I-G-E. -E. There, there's a town in Belgium called Liege, and Belgium is known for three things. They all begin with B's. Does anybody know what they are? You got Belgian waffles. Bicycles. What's the third one? Beer. 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 Well, there you go. So, our, 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 family, our family embraces two of them. We embrace, we embrace the, uh, the Belgian waffles and the bicycles. And so, we're, we're going to be making these liege waffles. A, a friend of mine that's another cyclist, uh, he's an attorney friend. We, we probably text or email back and forth about 10 times a day. He's writing legal briefs and, and I'm writing sermons. And he was actually a teacher of mine in high school. And he told me about these waffles, and these waffles are made with a special kind of sugar called pearl sugar. Now, you know, we called Harris Teeter, we called, uh, we called Fresh Market, we called Whole Foods, we called Trader Joe's. Do you have pearl sugar? No, never heard of that. What is pearl sugar? Well, pearl sugar is a special kind of sugar made in Belgium, and the size that you use for these liege waffles is called P45. Okay, so so each uh, little ball of sugar, each little pearl of sugar is about that big around. Okay, and so you got to make the, the waffles the night before. It's about to make the dough is about a five hour process. Okay, so you you got to put the ingredients in there, let the dough rise just like you're making bread. Then you beat it down and then you put it in the fridge overnight. And then the next morning you take this pearl sugar. We actually had to order it from the internet. Two pounds of pearl sugar came to our house. We have some enough to make a few batches. So, and then you put the pearl sugar in tomorrow morning. And when you make those waffles, the pearl sugar will crystallize in each one of the little square pockets. And so it'll be caramelized. Doesn't that sound good? And each waffle without any butter or syrup or anything is 500 calories, okay? So, uh, and that's like, that's like, you know, that's just a regular size waffle, all right? So there, there'll be a lot of exercise that go with the liege waffles as well. The bike, the bicycling will help you with that. The beer will not, okay? So I will just add on the extra pounds, all right? So, so the, the liege waffles, and we're going to be making liege waffles tonight. And I want to uh, put forth or argue, for lack of a better word, this afternoon that Jesus came to die for us to eat liege waffles on Sunday morning. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Okay, so if you have a Bible, please open it either on your phone or in your hands or, or on an iPad or a Kindle or, or whatever. Open your Bible to, uh, to the Gospel of Luke. Now, what is so fascinating about Luke, you know, Luke is one of the synoptic Gospels. Uh, one of the three, Matthew and Mark, are also synoptic Gospels. Luke actually focuses more on the surrounding events of Jesus' death in terms of the, uh, the nature, the, the uh, eschatological events, which is just a big word that means kind of the last day ideas that surround Jesus' death more than any of the other gospel writers, okay? In fact, he is the only one that really focuses on the darkness. And so since we've been talking about darkness for the last couple months or so, I thought it would be best for us to look at Luke's account of Jesus' death on the cross and the darkness that takes place. Now, the darkness that takes place during this story is different than the darkness that has taken place in the other stories that we have studied. Remember, we talked about how in the beginning God creates and there is darkness. That darkness is natural, right? And then we talk about how God makes the covenant with Abram and it's darkness that comes in the evening at night. It's natural darkness. Remember, the only darkness that we may be able to argue is not necessarily natural darkness. is when Jonah is in the belly of the fish, but after all, if you've ever been in a fish belly, it's pretty dark in there, at least until you cut it open, okay? So, you know, that's kind of a natural darkness. So, but this darkness is not natural, okay? This darkness starts at noon, 
and it goes until 3 o'clock. So this is an unnatural, or we could say it is a supernatural darkness. Verse 44 of chapter 23. It was now about noon, and darkness covered the whole earth until about 3 o'clock, while the sun stopped shining. Then the curtain in the sanctuary tore down the middle, crying out in a loud voice, Jesus said, Father, into your hands I entrust my life. After he said this, he breathed for the last time. When the centurion saw what happened, he praised God, saying, It's really true. This man was righteous. All the crowds who had come together to see this event returned to their homes beating their chests after seeing what had happened. That means they were in deep sorrow. And everyone who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance observing these things. Now, there are a lot of interesting things going on in this passage, and I want to touch on them briefly, and then we'll, we'll look at a couple that help us understand more about why God brings darkness during the three hours that Jesus dies. Okay, one of, the, one of the things we know is that this is not a natural darkness, not only because it's during the middle of the day, but because it is impossible for an eclipse of the sun, of the moon, to take place at this time. Why? Because at Passover, Passover always takes place during a full moon, okay? And it is scientifically impossible for an eclipse to happen when there is a full moon. Okay, so scientifically, an eclipse cannot happen with the sun, okay? The second thing that is interesting is that uh, when, the, when the veil tears down in the sanctuary, there is some argument that, that there is the wrath of God taking place and he's upset, and, and that is an idea, and, and in fact, there is an idea that says that the darkness is primary because of the presence of evil, the demonic, satanic presence that is present. I, I tend to not believe that because in Scripture to this point we've seen a lot of instances where God's most intimate, closest moments with humanity is in literal darkness. Another thing that we discover, and we're going to talk about this some, is that uh, when Jesus says, Father, into your hands I entrust my life, he is actually quoting a prayer that is taught to Jewish children and that they pray into adulthood. So it's a prayer that we find in Psalms chapter 31, verse 5, which says, I entrust my spirit into your hands. You, Lord, God of faithfulness, you have saved me. Okay, so every night of his life, Jesus would have prayed this prayer because this was the traditional Jewish prayer that you pray when, I, when, when you go to bed. All right, and then the next thing that we find that unfortunately we're not going to have a lot of time to spend on today, but Luke brings women to the focus more than any of the other gospel writers. And he does it throughout the story, showing that women are equal in their uh, heartfelt following of the person Jesus. And we see this in verse 49, and everyone who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance observing these things, okay? So let's just, let's just kind of jump in and, and start with the beginning. So God's presence has come down and is near to Christ. All right, in Scripture we see and we've studied that whenever God wants to be as close as he can be to his people, he allows darkness to veil his presence. And so I have no reason to believe that at this time, when Jesus is in a place where he needs God, and where God is so close to him, and their plan is about to be accomplished, that God has not brought this darkness so that he may come as close to Christ, his son, as possible. Now, there is no doubt that there is a satanic presence taking place. Remember when Jesus previously has been offered the vinegar? Okay, that's like the equivalent, that's like their whiskey. Okay, so, so Jesus, that's like a drink of whiskey to numb the senses. Jesus refuses it, okay, because he, he wants to keep his senses all together, all right? And, and then he has mocking, and people are taunting him and saying, if you really are the Son of God, come down from the cross, and he has stayed upon the cross. 
But what is extremely interesting, and we're going to, uh, to go down to uh, verse 46 for this. What is extremely interesting is that Luke records that Jesus cried out in a loud voice. Now, if you cry out in a loud voice, you are what? You're, you're heard. You're also strong. If you are weak, if you are at the point of physical exhaustion, are you able to make a loud sound? Absolutely not. So even Jesus, okay, who has been beaten, who has been ridiculed, who has spikes through his wrists and through his feet, still has great strength in him. Now granted, he is bearing a very spiritual weight on him, which is the sins of humanity, but he is not dying because of physical exhaustion. All of the commentators agree on this. The fact that he cries out in a loud voice is proof that he voluntarily gives his life to be our substitute for sin. No one kills him. He allows himself to be killed and that he enters into death on purpose. Okay, so what is God doing during this time? Well, God's presence, either his presence or he sends an angel to do it. We don't know exactly how it takes place. Now, what is interesting is that Mark and Matthew record this differently. Mark and Matthew tell us that the veil is torn at the end of the darkness, and they tell us that Jesus dies at the end of the darkness, and then the veil is torn. Luke records it differently. And that kind of gives us a, a little bit of difficulty with, okay, who said the right thing and who said the wrong thing? But today we're looking at Luke, so we're going to view this through what Luke, how Luke tells the story, okay? So, in Luke's story, the veil is torn while darkness is still present, okay? So, which means that darkness is present, which means who is present? God. God is present. Now, what is extremely interesting, and this is not found in Scripture, but we found a historical account of this, in the uh, from Josephus, and it also comes uh, from part of the uh, the Jewish literature that is written that we find written 40 years after Christ dies. So at the at the front of the temple compound, there are two huge iron gates. Okay, this is at the second temple. Herod's temple was another name for it. These gates are so heavy that in order for them to be manually open, it takes many many men lifting one gate to open the gate, okay? Two gates, and they're shut. Now, the gates are the gates for what at this point? They're the gates for the outer court, right? And remember, if you have remembered or seen pictures of the, of the Hebrew Jewish temple, you go from, the, from those gates into the outer court, and then from there you have the holies, and then the holy of holies was the most holy place, okay? So those iron gates, according to history, are locked at midnight of the Passover. And mysteriously, they open. Now that's not recorded in scripture, but it's recorded in history. So it's an historical account by a historian named Josephus, who is a contemporary of Jesus. He lives at the same time of Christ, but he doesn't write about it until some 40 years later, right before Jerusalem is destroyed. But when he writes about it, he says, almost 40 years ago, the iron gates of the temple were locked and closed at midnight on Passover, and they mysteriously opened. Why is that important? Well, we find out in the book of Acts that many priests believe in Jesus. Okay, so, so when the apostles begin preaching and teaching and, and very strongly talk about how, how uh, the people that are present, that are living, killed Jesus, they begin to believe because God has already been convicting their hearts with the mourning and the beating of the chest, but the priests are also believing, not only because they have seen those gates mysteriously open, but they have also seen the veil of the temple is separating those holy of holies from the holy place, torn down the middle. What does that mean? Well, it could mean that God is wrathful and he's upset and he's frustrated and so he throws the gates of the, the locked gates open on his own and he tears that veil and it could mean that he's upset and you know, that, that could be one explanation. Another explanation could be that what he set up 
to be a guide and to be a uh, so what, something that he used to lead people to Jesus is no longer needed. Okay, so the religious system that God set up, the Jewish religious system, once Jesus dies on the cross, is no longer needed. All right, now listen to this closely. At this point in time, once Jesus has died, there is no more need for religion. You may say, well, you know, I'm, I'm a religion, I'm a Christian, or, you know, I'm a religion. Uh, you may be a Jew, you may be agnostic, you, know, you, you may be Muslim. No religion. Once Jesus dies, God kills the religion. It's no longer needed. Why? Paul writes about it. He says, because we have a high priest that is Christ. The book of Hebrews is all about it. How we go to our high priest directly, and our high priest takes us directly to the Son of God. To God, to God himself, to God the Father. Okay? So the Son of God, our high priest, takes us directly to the Father. There is no need for the religion. Religion is done. Religion is done. So my kids say a lot of funny things, and last night, uh, usually we do, uh, we have a tradition, you know, so no tr religion, but we still have traditions. And so we, we uh, make challah bread, Ashley makes challah bread, which is a Jewish bread that uh, is a traditional Jewish bread to eat on Friday nights. And so usually we do that. Last night we did it, we were still talking to the kids about Jesus and Sabbath, and, and I was praying, and I said to them, I said, you know, I said, I'm so thankful for Sabbath, uh, because it's a time when our family can spend together and that we can rest. And then, you know, I had to be honest, and I said, well, you know, honestly, I said, uh, I said, I know Daddy doesn't get to see you much on Sabbath. I said, you know, this is the day that I get to see you least of any other day. And uh, Anna said to me, she says the funniest things, she said, I know Daddy, and I don't like that, because on Sabbath, other daddies are with their families, but you're the priest. As you call me a priest. I felt like 12 inches tall. You know, you're the priest. But, but there's no need for a priest anymore, okay? It may make me feel good. I've been calling a priest one other time. That was nice, too. But, you know, it, uh, there is no priest because Jesus is the priest. We don't need any other religion because Jesus is our priest. He is our, if you want a religion, Jesus is your religion. Follow him. That's that's. All, that's all it is. All it is. And what, this is digression. And, and all Jesus brings is freedom. All he brings is freedom. And so if you feel like you need a religion, your religion is freedom in Christ. That is what, that is all you need at this point in time. Okay, back, back to the text. So and this is what happens next. Okay, so, so after Jesus, he cries out, Father, into your hands I trust my life. Why would he say life and then breathe his last? Because according to Genesis in the creation account, when God created us, God makes us out of dust, he breathes into us, and then we become living beings, right? So our breath, no matter when you breathe, whether you remember that you're breathing or not, and all of us breathe sometimes on purpose, if we've been exercising or underwater a long time, you know, then we are really thinking about that next breath. Most of the time we breathe without realizing it. Every single breath that we take comes from God. From a biblical creation narrative, we believe that, and we believe that every single breath comes from God, okay? Even O2, all right, that's oxygen. That's what we're breathing. That's what God makes. He breathes it. Somehow it's present, and it's in each one of us. And once we no longer have that, we're no longer living. That's the way it works. And when Jesus gives up his breath in this darkness with all of the weight of the sins on him, even though he's still strong and he chooses to give up his breath, he does it in a way in which he dies well. He dies well. Now what does that mean for us right now? It's really important the story. Because since Jesus dies well, the centurion believes in him. Doesn't he? 
When the centurion saw what happened, he praised God, saying, It's really true, this man was righteous. Because Jesus died. Well, so what does that mean for you and for me? In the darkness that we experience, whether it be depression, or whether it be a relationship, or whether it be despair, or whether it be a challenge, or a, a, something new that we don't feel equipped for, whatever darkness we are in, we must go through it well. We must die in it well. Because when we die in darkness, in a strong way, with resting in God, that's what Jesus is doing, by resting in God, we are a witness to other people. Not what we know, as much as how we live and how we die. How we live and how we die. So much so, you know in the book of Acts, when those 3,000 people are baptized at Pentecost, it's not because Peter is preaching a great sermon, although the Bible says that the Holy Spirit was with him. But that conversion already started taking place because Jesus died well. Because all the crowds, verse 48, all the crowds who had come together to see this event returned to their homes, beating their chests after seeing what had happened. That is where those 3,000 baptisms in the book of Acts come from, right here. Because Jesus died well. What does it look like to die well? You know, I, I don't know why I never realized this. It wasn't until this week. And I'm reading a book um, on the cross right now. It's called 40 Days to the Cross. And when I was reading it, and they, they have, uh, it's, it's a neat little book. There's a psalm that you read, a, a psalm of confession. Each day, it's like a little devotional. You have a psalm of confession, and then a reading from the New Testament, and then a reading from a, a historic Christian thinker, and then you have a reflection question. And something I realized this week, and you would think, you know, being an Adventist pastor, I would have figured this out before, but I didn't. Okay, so... You know, you, you think about death, and I've never died. I've had lots of loved ones die. I've had friends die. I've had pets die, okay? Um, you know, fish you flush down the toilet and worry about them a lot. Everybody else is kind of mattered. Uh, but I never, I've never died, so I've never thought a lot about what happens to me when I die, except for the fact that I, I won't see my wife again if I die before she does, or I won't see, you know, my children anymore, or... I won't see, you know, about what, you know, land gets developed or when we finally get to start flying like the Jetsons. You know, I mean, I, that type of stuff, you know, I think about. But I never thought about the fact that when I'm dead, I don't even get to talk with God anymore. Because you know, the Bible says that I'm asleep, right? And we know that Jesus doesn't spend time with his Father until after he's resurrected on the third day, after he takes up his life again, right? Because he tells Mary when she sees him and mistakes him for the gardener, and she worships him, and he says, don't hold on to me because I haven't yet ascended to my Father. So when we die, and I talk to God all the time, you know, because I, I like talking to him, and I like sitting with him, but when I die, I won't get to talk to him. You know, and so I don't understand it. It's a mystery. My, my, my breath goes back to him. He holds it. He's ready to return it to me. But while I'm in that place, and I know the Bible says it's like a sleep, and even in the New Testament, uh, when Stephen dies as the first Christian martyr, they liken his sleep, his death to sleep. So I know that I'll be asleep, and I may not know. But to me, that saddens me to know that that, that is probably the one person that I would like to keep talking to, no matter what. And you know, that's, that's where darkness leads us, isn't it? We talked about that two weeks ago. Remember with, with Jesus calming the storm? And how Jesus is the only thing left? And, and how Jesus doesn't want them. He wants the disciples to not depend on his words. He wants them not to depend on his actions. He wants them to depend on, to depend on what? His presence, right? His presence. And darkness ultimately leads us. To God's presence. And so I guess I could think and realize and preach to myself to be able to understand that even when I'm dead, and even though I don't know it, with God holding my breath, 
I'm still in his presence. I may not be cognizant of it. I may not be thinking about it. But he has me. And he has you too. And so whatever you're facing, you know, financial challenge, depression, relationship, new job, whatever it is, whatever darkness that God has brought on you to come closer to you, die well. Enter that darkness well so that there is nothing left but you and the presence of God because that is what you were created for. You and the presence of God. Let's pray. Father, thank you that Jesus died and rose again, and so we have hope. Because of your love for us, we have hope that we will continually be in your presence. In Jesus' name I pray.